Good morning. And uh, we greet you in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are richly blessed by his grace and his love that he has allowed us this opportunity to share together in believers' worship or share together in the Lord's worship. And uh, we are so grateful that God has allowed us another Lord's Day to join uh, together. I want to uh, honor uh, my dear friend and uh, your pastor, uh, Dr. David Chauncey, who is doing a great work for the Lord. May we please give God praise for him and all that he is doing. <clears throat> he has been a dear friend, and uh, so we are grateful and uh, appreciative of him uh, thinking highly enough of us to allow us to come and share the Word of God with you all and to all of the staff and volunteers that have been so gracious and have done such a wonderful job in uh, moving worship forward and, and uh, making a wonderful atmosphere uh, for the Lord's uh, worship to occur. Uh, we are grateful to your service to the Lord uh, today as well. I want to uh, also recognize, uh, he was here earlier, I don't know if he's still in the building now, uh, but Dr. Garrett Crawford was here earlier and uh, how I have admired him through the years, a great man of God that has served God so well and so uh, even if he's no longer in the building, we still want to honor him for the work he has done. God has blessed me with a lovely wife uh, and daughter. My family are, are over there and if you see her, then you will see that God blessed me that a guy like me could get a wife like her. and so. I'm grateful, grateful that Dr. Taylor, Dr. Courtney Taylor is here, and uh, I'm appreciative of God's grace for us being here. To those that are joining online, thank you so much. I forgot to do that this morning to say uh, to those that are joining online, God bless you and thank you for joining in the Lord's worship today. Uh, may we say a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for the blessed privilege of being able to share and worship. We pray, our Father, for those that are not saved. We pray that you would save them today. We pray for those that are struggling in their faith and have strayed away. We pray that you sanctify us and draw us closer to you today. And we pray for those that are growing weak and weary on the journey. We pray that you would give them strength today. These are your servants' prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I love the Lord Jesus and I love his word. Join me in his word in the book of Acts chapter number four. Book of Acts chapter number four in whatever copy of the scriptures uh, you have, whether electronic or a hard copy Bible. Join me in Acts chapter number four, beginning at verse number one. <clears throat> now I want you to know that I am a good Baptist preacher uh, and so I'm glad to be among Baptists. I am Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I will be Baptist dead. <laughs> but being a Baptist, I like to hear amens every now and then. And I shared with the morning group that uh, the more they say amen, the faster I go because that means you're getting it. And, and they got the message because we got out 10 minutes early in the morning service. So now I hope you all can do as well as they did and you can say amen pretty good. All right. Amen. Let's see that got quick learners. See there you got it. You, you, you're already learning. <laughs> all right. Acts chapter number four, verse number one, the word of God reads, and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And as they laid hands on them and put them hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Today's message is how to share the gospel, how to share the gospel or how to share your faith concerning the gospel. Several years ago in Rhode Island, in a seaport town, or in a coastal town rather, uh, there was a small rescue mission that would go out and would rescue uh, fishermen and boaters, sometimes swimmers, that got caught up in the storms on the sea. This little rescue mission was known for often going out and, and rescuing boaters that, whose boats had become uh, enabled and immobilized out on the waters and they would bring them to safety. Sometimes those boaters had been capsized and they would bring them to shore and bring them to safety, saving their lives. They got so good at what they did that uh, they started saving so many people that they said we needed to erect a small shanty, a small shack that can at least house our supplies and at least house some blankets and, and maybe some life vests for the times when we go out to try to help those that are struggling and about to die out on the sea. And so indeed they did. They, they erected a, a little small, modest little shack, nothing more than a storage shed to, to hold their supplies. But as time went on and they continued to rescue people from the the stormy seas, they said we need a little bit more modern and a larger facility, something that has maybe a a shower and something that maybe has some bunk beds so that we can sleep uh, and maybe a small kitchenette for us to cook meals while we're here on long shifts. And indeed, they did. A little small, modest building was erected in order that they could bring people to safety, wrap them up and keep them warm, feed them while they were waiting to be uh, taken to a hospital. And so it was a, it was a great work and they were saving hundreds of people often throughout the year. As time went on, they, they said, well, this is too modest of a building for us. We're doing such amazing, such good work. We need to have more modern and nicer facilities. So they added on to the facility. They added a recreation area. They added a lounge area. They, they added more modern restrooms. They, they added a lavish uh, uh, sports and activities room with a billiards table, pool table in it. It was a nice facility. And as more people started to join, some said, well, we don't really, we aren't able to swim that well. We aren't able to really go out on boats and, and rescue people, but we, we like what you all are doing, so we want to be a part of what's happening here. As time went on, they, they added more, and they added more people. They added on more to the facility, and, and finally they said, well, you know, that stuff about going out to sea, it's kind of dangerous. That stuff about rescuing fishermen and rescuing swimmers, that's a little bit too much. So We'll let other people do that, but we'll remain together and we'll just call ourselves a club. Friend, what one time was a rescue mission became nothing more than a social club. And unfortunately, there are many churches that have become just the same way. They've forgotten about their work and their calling and their mission to go out and to to call men and women out of the lost seas of life and bring them to safety in Jesus Christ. And it's a very unfortunate story. In our text, we drop in on Peter and John who show us that as Christians, one of the greatest challenges that we will ever stand upon or ever have is to stand upon our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ during times of cultural persecution. Peter and John in the text demonstrate to us how believers can hold firm to their faith in God despite the concerted effort of the culture and persecution that seeks to silence the witness of New Testament believers. Here's a fact. Only 2.4 billion of the 7.8 billion people in the world profess to be Christians. Listen to it again. Only 2.4 billion of the 7.8 billion people in the world 
are professing Christians. But let's draw it a little bit closer to home. Uh, the, in the United States, the number of professing Christians has declined from 78% in just uh, 2007 to less than 63% when asked in 2019. The decline in Christian professions is steep, and it's only getting steeper. But here's good news. Seven out of 10 people who are not Christians in the, in the United States today say they will be open to hearing a gospel presentation and learning more about Jesus if their friends, family members, or neighbors were to share the message of the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Seven out of 10. But unfortunately, only 36% of professing Christians believe it is their responsibility to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my brothers and sisters in the faith, I want to say to you today that one of the greatest charges and one of the greatest opportunities and blessings that you and I enjoy today is the opportunity to tell a dying world that Jesus is still a living Savior. Amen goes there. That, that's where you say amen. Our blessed privilege is being able to bring light in a dark world, in a world where suicides are increasing, in a world where violence is increasing, in a world where depression is increasing, and every other negative thing that you can think of is increasing. It is our privilege, it is our blessing, but also our mandate and calling to bring light into the midst of this darkness. And when you read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is all about God's work through the local New Testament church. In Acts chapter number one, you see a planned church. Jesus declares that, that they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter number two, you find a powerful or power-filled church when the church receives the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter number three, a productive church that goes out and does the work of ministry and missions and changes lives by the power of the gospel. And here in Acts chapters number four through eight is the unfortunate portion of Acts, uh, but fortunate because of its impact on the gospel. You see in Acts chapters four through eight, a persecuted church that goes out and spreads the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. This church is under great conflict. And in chapter four, verse number one, you see the conflict that came uh, from those who wanted to maintain the status quo. When you hear all of those names of the high priests and the relig religious rulers, it's people that simply wanted to maintain the status quo and did not want anything to change what was already going on. In verse number two, you find a conflict with the culture that comes even when we do what is right, that the culture pushes back and says, no, we don't want any of that Jesus business. And then in verse number three and four, you see the conflict with the culture that can still, though, produce change for Christ and change for God. Five thousand souls are added to God's kingdom. And may I share with you, friend, that nobody gets excited about numbers. When I talked about 2.4 billion people are professing Christians, only 7.8 uh, billion people in the world, there's a huge gap there. Nobody gets excited about those numbers, but here's the truth about numbers. There's a soul tied to every one of those numbers. Amen goes there. That's somebody's son tied to one of those numbers. That's somebody's daughter tied to one of those numbers. That's someone's grandson, granddaughter tied to one of those numbers. And God is in the business of saving souls. I've got three things that God lifts up from the text uh, for us to see to help us feel more comfortable, but not just comfortable, but confident in sharing our faith. Number one, number one, if you're keeping track, is to be spiritually convicted, spiritually convicted. It's in verse number eight. The Bible says there very clearly, then Peter, stop, don't read too fast, then Peter. If you read the Bible too fast, you might miss something. That name being there is significant because you have to ask yourself, who is Peter? This is the same Peter that Jesus finds with his brother mending their nets as Jesus walks on the shore of Galilee and says, come 
and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Bible says, and straightway, that means without hesitation, straightway, without thinking about it, without asking a bunch of questions, you know, he, they got in a hurry and they followed Jesus. And let me share this with you. I didn't share it with the morning group, but you all uh, uh, are, are nice. And so I, I'll share it with you all this afternoon. And that is this, that when the Lord calls, get in a hurry and go straightway. Don't wait until later. Don't wait until another time. Don't say I'm too busy right now. I got other things going. You'll always be busy. But when the Lord's voice is speaking and when God is moving on your heart, get in a hurry and go straight away. They immediately got up and followed after Jesus. And so as they go and follow after Jesus, Jesus opens up opportunities and shows them things about God's power and God's grace that they had never experienced or seen before. This is the same Peter that is with Jesus when Jesus feeds 5,000. This is the same Peter that is with Jesus when Jesus turns water to wine. Same Peter that is with Jesus as Jesus is on the mountain of transfiguration. It was Peter, James, and John, and the glory of God shines through, and two witnesses show up from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, to confirm the messianic grace of in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Peter that says, Lord, let us build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, for it is good that we have been here. Same Peter that walks on the water when Jesus is out on the Sea of Galilee and they are afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus says, come, Peter. And Peter walks on the water to Jesus. But as he's about to go under, he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus grabs him by the hand and pulls him out of the stormy gale. Friend, this Peter has experience with Jesus. Same Peter, same Peter that when the soldiers come to the Garden of Gethsemane to apprehend Jesus, same Peter pulls out his knife, chops off the soldier's ear. Jesus puts the ear back on, tells Peter, put your knife away for uh, uh, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. But this is also the same Peter who was typically the spokesman in the group. This is the Peter that when Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? The disciples respond, some say you're Isaiah, some say you're Elias, some say you're one of the other prophets, and then Jesus gets pointed. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds with a glorious declaration of faith. Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus responds, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Friend, listen to me and listen to me well. Jesus declared that he loves the church. He declared that he would build the church and there is nothing that the world can ever say or do that will stop the Lord's church. If we stand with Jesus, Jesus will stand with us. Amen goes right there. And so this is, this is that Peter. This is that Peter that had experience. But Jesus says something else. Peter says, Peter says Lord, I love you. I'll, I'll, I'll stand with you always. And Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you are going to deny me. For Satan has desired to have you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Same Peter, that when Jesus is taken, he wants to fight. But as Jesus is taken to the cross, he wants to run. And indeed, just as Jesus had prophesied, Peter runs away. The soldiers come and ask him, aren't you one of those that walked with Jesus? No, I don't know him. That's what Peter's response was. They ask him a second time, your speech betrays you. You're one of those Galileans. Aren't you one of those Christians with Jesus? No, I don't know him. And then they ask him a third time and he makes an erroneous oath. He lies and says, I don't even know the man. And at that very moment, the rooster crowed three times. And can you imagine the conviction that came in Peter's heart? That the very thing that Jesus told him would do, he would do, he did it. He goes away ashamed. He goes away broken. He goes away sorrowful. He goes away uh, under guilt. And when he hears that Jesus has died, can you imagine the Christ that has loved him? He turns his back on him. And now for all he knows, that Jesus is dead and gone. And the last experience they had together was him running away from Christ. Imagine how brokenhearted he was. Imagine how wounded he was in his heart. 
Imagine the guilt that came upon him. But all that glorious day when Jesus gets up and rises from the dead, that's what we just celebrated on Easter, that he's not a dead Savior, he's a living Savior. And he tells Mary, he says, go tell Peter and my disciples. Tell them that I have arisen. He, he specifically says, tell Peter, because he wants Peter to know whatever you've done, I've forgiven. Whatever you, you, you thought that was between us, it's all said and done with. And I'm glad that I have a Christ that forgives me the wrongs that I do. And that's why I'm pointing this out to you. Because Peter is preaching Jesus knowing that Jesus has forgiven him of his sins. Knowing that Jesus has looked past his faults. Jesus has gone beyond the mistakes that he has made. And, and the, the terrible uh, uh, declaration that he does not know him. And Jesus says all is forgiven. And when you know that your sins have been forgiven by the the grace, power, and love of God, it should make you want to tell the world about Jesus. When you really know that it was Christ that when others would have uh, turned their backs on you, when others would have totally been done with you, when others would have laughed you to scorn, others would have tried to get you back, but Jesus knows everything that you've done, everything that I've done, and he still loves us. We don't sing it much anymore, but it's still a good song to sing. We don't sing it much because many of us don't feel guilty about the stuff we've done, but it's a good song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When you really know what God has done in order to love you despite you not being lovable, you will be glad to tell the world about him. That's the man that's talking here. It is Peter, not just the preacher, but it's Peter, the pardoned and the forgiven. Anybody else in here pardoned and forgiven? Amen ought to go there. Then here, here the text says, then Peter, but verse, clause, uh, verse 8 clause B says this, being filled with the Holy Spirit, makes, uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and elders, here. The Bible teaches us why Peter was so bold. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness that you need to share your faith and your convictions in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is not speaking from the standpoint of just being confident. He's speaking from the standpoint of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And may I share with you that if you have, your sins have been forgiven and Christ has come into your heart, he has given you every bit of power and of grace that you need to tell the dying world about a living Savior. And some may say, well, listen, I don't know how to speak that well. I don't know much about the Bible. I haven't been a Christian very long. Listen, friend, God specializes in taking those that would seemingly think they are unfit for service and using them for service because here's, watch it, what's important, that your goodness is insufficient. It's not because of how good you are that you can be effective in sharing your faith. It's because of how good Jesus is. Amen. There was a man named Moses. He said, Lord, I, I, I know what you said. I, I should go and tell Pharaoh, let your people go. But I'm a man with a stammering tongue. I can't speak that well. And God says, open your mouth, Moses, and I'll speak for you. There was a man named Abraham that came long before Moses, who, who was a man that he couldn't tell the truth. He, he denied uh, being married to his wife on several occasions, but yet he still walked in faith and God still used him. There was a man named Jacob that he deceived his blind, dying daddy. He tricked his brother out of a meal of food. He had bad relationships with his father-in-law. And yet God took that trickster, deceiver, and supplanter and made him a nation. God took a little boy named David that everybody overlooked because he was too young. And God says, it doesn't matter how young you are, I can still use you. He took a man named Isaiah, who Isaiah said by his own lips that he had a cursing problem. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. He took Daniel, who worked for the traitor government. He took Ezekiel. He took Jeremiah. He took Jonah, who ran from God when God called him, and he still used him. He took Hosea, who was a man that was married to a prostitute, and still used him. So listen, if God can use all of those people, what's your excuse? If God can use them, he can use you, he can use me, he can use anybody to his honor and glory who would but submit to him. In Luke chapter 12, verse number 12, the Bible says, for the Holy Spirit 
will teach you at the very hour what must be said. This wasn't in my message earlier, but let me drop it in here. The reason that I love the Pauline epistles and love to preach and teach about Paul is because Paul's conversion shows us that it does not matter how far outside the the work of God you are, that you can still find yourself in the will of God and in the providence of God. And God can take the worst of sinners. That's what Paul calls himself. He said, I'm the chief of sinners and God can still use you. You've just got to be spiritually convicted. But number two, not only spiritually convicted, but number two, show results of a converted life. In verses 9 and 10, this is what the text says. Verse 9, if we are being examined today, being questioned about the good deed done to this disabled man and by what means he has been made whole. Well, what man are they talking about? It's back in Acts chapter number three. In Acts chapter number three, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the Bible says being the ninth hour, and there is laid at the gate of the temple uh, called Beautiful, a man that is begging for charity. And Peter and John stop and say uh, to him, look on us. That was the first thing that they said, look on us. They stopped long enough to actually engage with him on a deeper level than just a transactional, here, let me give you a few coins of charity so you can be quiet. Friend, can I tell you this? That we can give to charity all we want, but until we give people Jesus, we have not solved their issue. And so they say uh, 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 to this man, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have, give we unto you in the name of Jesus. And what a powerful, what a wonderful, what a glorious name is the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. They grabbed him by the right hand, pulled him up, and those legs that were at one time weak and wilted, they get strength, and that man goes running and leaping and praising God. But that's not the glorious thing in the text. The glorious thing in the text is this, that the man that was laid at the temple gate is now leaping and running to the temple and he runs past the people that had just walked past him. As a matter of fact, he runs past people that have walked past him every day, that have seen him where he was and did nothing about his condition and he's praising God. They got legs and they've been using them all their lives. He, he had legs and could not use them. They had legs, didn't want to praise God. He has now legs that are useful and he goes praising God and watch what happened. They asked, how did this happen? And Peter and John say, I'm glad you asked. It's in Jesus' name. And you know what happened? Thousands of people received Jesus Christ. And what a glorious thing. Every miracle that God does is an opportunity to share the gospel. It's a calling card for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to be shared with a lost world. And that's the problem that occurred here is that the Sanhedrin is up. They are upset because the gospel has gone forward and they have no answer for it. They already had a problem in an empty tomb. A man was crucified, laid in a tomb and the tomb is empty. That's a big problem. But now lives are being changed. And Peter and John said, this man stands before you. Verse number 10, let it be known unto you all that and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, this man stands here before you whole. Can I share with you, friends, that that is one of the great things about the gospel, and that is it changes lives. Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And there are some living epistles in the room today that your declaration is that if you would just believe in Jesus Christ, he can change your life. There are some in here that you should never forget the testimony of where God brought you from, what God delivered you from, what God has done in your life because you stand as a living testimony to the power of the gospel. There are some of you that God has delivered from alcoholism. Tell the world, God delivered me. There are some of you that God has delivered you from horrific family situations. Tell them that I'm standing today because God delivered me. There are some of you here today 
today that God delivered you from depression, del delivered you from addictions and all other type of things. Some of you that God delivered from things that nobody else knew about, but you know what God can do and you are a living example of the power of God. And listen, somebody needs to know it because you don't know the struggle that someone else has. Because any of us that know how God is a deliverer, he delivers those that look like they've got it all together, but quietly their lives are falling apart. He delivers people that walk around with smiles on their faces in public, but who go home and contemplate suicide every night. He delivers those that are broken and wounded in their hearts. And he says, come here, I'll take out that stony heart. I'll take out that, that broken heart and I'll give you a heart of love and righteousness. And we need to believe it again. Paul says that he is ex he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever think or imagine. Listen to me. That has everything to do with salvation. There are some of you that have a family member that you've been praying for that God would save them. Pray on, God can save, but also tell them on about the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. There are some of you that have parents that you're a Christian now, but you didn't grow up in a Christian home and your parents are still not Christians. But I'm here to tell you, if you would live on mission for the gospel, if you would share the gospel that your mom, your dad, that you've been praying for, God is still able to save. But watch it. Peter and John say it's based on the name of Jesus. You see... The converted life shows not our power, but it shows his power. In John chapter 5, there's a man that's laid at the, uh, at the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be made whole? And he says, uh, every time I try to get in the water, somebody else gets in when the angel troubles the water. And so there's no chance for me. There's no opportunity. Jesus said, listen, 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 I didn't, I didn't ask you that. I want to know, do you want to be better? The man says, yes. Jesus says, well, get up. Take up your bed and walk. And so now the bed that the man used to lay on, now the bed is on the man. And he's walking through the city and some of these same religious rulers that are questioning Peter and John here in Acts chapter 4, they were present in John chapter 5 and they asked him, who told you to get up off of your bed? And he says, I don't know. But all I know, he told me to rise up and walk. And then later on, he told him it was Jesus. Then there was another man blind from birth and, and his eyes are restored. And somebody asked, well, who told you to be healed on, on the Sabbath day? And he says, I don't know his name, but all I know is whereas I once was blind, now I can see. Later on, he finds out it was Jesus. Friend, can I tell you this? That Jesus is still the answer today. That when people want to know how is it that you got off of drugs? How is it that you put down the bottle? How is it that your life has been restored? How is it that you now have joy? I don't know. All I know is name is Jesus. And that's our third, third and final point is that we got to be spiritually convicted. We got to show the results of a converted life. There has to be transformation. There needs to be change in your life and in mine. But number three, we share our convictions about the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 11, the Bible says, this is the stone which was set at naught by ye builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. He's the cornerstone. And anyone that's a builder knows that the cornerstone is what they use to get, to get the plumb line. It's, it's what they use to get the square of the building. And if any builders that are in the house know that if you don't square up your building, everything goes wrong. If you don't square up that foundation, the doors won't shut right, the windows won't close right, everything is going to be off if you don't square up the building. And friend, can I tell you that that's the challenge with many of our families today. 
is that we haven't squared up our family lives with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't made Jesus our foundation. That's the challenge that we see in our communities and in our world today. We don't need more social programs. We need more gospel preaching. That's a challenge in many of our churches today, that, that we preach everything but Jesus. We, we have self-help seminars, but we don't have salvation meetings where we call people to come unto Jesus Christ. We have times where we have turned crew, uh, what should have been uh, a battleship into a cruise ship. We have made our churches cruise ships that are built for comfort, that are built with amenities, that are built to make people feel happy and, and nice. And if I don't like this cruise ship, then I'll go and if I don't like... Uh, uh, carnival I'll go to Royal Caribbean if I don't like Royal Caribbean I'll go to the other and that's the way we treat church but God never designed the church to be a cruise ship he designed it to be a battleship that sends soldiers out to the battlefield to win people for Christ and so we turned our churches into places where we, we, we itch people's, we scratch people's itching ears with a, a syrupy gospel. We, we overinflate their egos and we pump up their pride rather than calling them to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. We need Jesus today. We don't need another self help seminar. Because at the end of the day, you can do all of that stuff in the self help world and still lose your life. I was preaching in my wife's hometown of Lexington, North Carolina. Anybody know where Lexington is? Lexington, North Carolina. All right, I got some in here. They say it's the barbecue capital of the South. It's up for debate. I, I debate her on that all the time. I was doing a revival meeting there, and, and a fellow stood up and gave, gave remarks, and he said, I, I don't remember all of his speech, but he said this, if you forget my name, you've lost nothing. But if you forget the name of Jesus, you've lost everything. And friend, let me share that with you. That you may forget many things, but if you forget the name of Jesus, you've lost everything. God save us from so-called Christians that want to be famous but don't want to be spiritual. God save us from preachers that want to have their name lifted up rather than God's name lifted up. God save us from this, this culture where we want to lift up pride rather than lift up a savior that can change and save men's lives. I'm still old school. I still believe that there's power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I still there, believe there's power for Jesus to save, for Jesus to heal, for Jesus to restore men's hearts. I still believe it. And that's what Peter believes. He says, listen, if you want us to say that we did this in our name, no, we didn't do it. Our names don't have enough power. If you want us to say that we did it under our authority, no, we don't have enough authority. But we have done it in the name of the only one that has power. And let me share this with you. That there are some people that think we're foolish for believing in Jesus. And so they will say, well, you know, I, I don't know about faith and religion. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. And I just try to live so that the universe blesses me. Well, friend, I don't know about the universe because the universe didn't wake me up this morning. I don't know about any universe because the universe didn't change my life. I don't know about all that stuff. But I do know the name of Jesus has power. As a matter of fact, one third Sunday morning in November 1990, when I was a boy of 11 years old, I said 10 earlier, but no, it was 11 years old, and I remember it distinctly because my grandmother was a good Christian woman, and she said, uh, when you turn 12, I want you to get baptized. So I made a deal because I love my grandma, and she, she cooked the best pound cake I ever had. So I said, Grandma, I'll get saved. I'll get baptized at 12. But it was one Sunday morning at 11 years old, when I heard the gospel and I understood exactly what it meant, and I said, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. And that Sunday morning, he came into my heart and he saved my soul. And I never will forget that day. I have been at the bedside of many people who have been transitioning from this life to the next. I have been at the bedsides of many people who were suffering from illnesses that were catastrophic. I've never once heard them call on the universe. I've never once had them call on the name of Buddha, the name of Mohammed. I've never once heard them call the name of Confucius or Zoroaster. I've never heard any of those. But they'd ask, preacher, will you pray to God for me? 
And I said, I'll pray, but I want to be specific in what God I'm praying to. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, can I tell you something? He's the only one that will ever get you out of the mess that we're in. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He himself is a Savior. And friend, let me tell you today that I don't care where you are, whether you're sitting up front or in the back, I don't care how, how far or how close away from Christ you are. If you would but just open your heart to him today, he will save you. He will deliver. He will change your life by his own grace and by his own power. And you say, wait a minute, preacher. I hear you talking, but you don't know how messed up my life is. That's the best place to be in. When you know how messed up you are, you'll find how wonderful a savior he is. It's not a it's not an easy thing to save a, drown, a drowning man who doesn't know he's drowning because he keeps trying to kick and try to save himself. And friend, you can't save yourself just like a drowning man can't save himself. It takes someone to come in and save. And I'm here to tell you, I was sinking one day deep in sin, far from the peaceful shores. Very deeply, I was stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And from the waters he lifted me, and now safe am I. God's love lifted me. When nothing and no one else could help, it was God's love that lifted me. Now, I've shared about how to share your faith. But come here to you that have never accepted Jesus. Lean in and listen to me. I wouldn't leave here today without calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew you'd be here today and he'd want you and he knew that he wanted you to hear his name. I have preached a message about Jesus and I've said his name hundreds of times in this one message. You know why? Because there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You've been listening to those preachers that'll tell you, you you can prosper and have all you want. So they, instead of preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, they preach a dollar and it's multiplied. Get all the money you want, but money won't save you at the end of your life. It won't restore your family. It won't get you out of the mess you're in. But it's Jesus who will do it. It's Jesus who will put your family back together. If you would but accept him. And so as I finish today, I want to give an invitation to those that have never accepted and received the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until another time. Ask him and he'll save you today. To those that have strayed away. You say, well, I haven't strayed away. I come to church every now and then. But let me ask you, is your heart close with God? Or is there some unrepented stuff in your life that you need God to straighten out? Why don't you ask God to straighten me out? And ask God to sanctify you, separate you from the things of this world. And then finally, maybe you're not a part of a church. You've been looking, you've been searching for a good church and maybe you moved to the area and you haven't found a church yet. Let me tell you, don't, don't drive another mile you're in the best place you can be. This is a Bible-believing church where you can grow in your Christian faith. But whatever your decision is today, you're going to make a decision. It's either going to be yes or no. But everyone's going to make a decision. And I pray you make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.